Let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts and some of my work here. So this is the um, roadmap. So I'm taking this opportunity to actually also look back as to um, what algorithms has done to the field. So I'll give you uh, what I think um, are the um, top three contributions of bioinformatics or algorithms to the field of biology in the sense that did it move the needle for biology? Okay, and, and um, I'll give you my top three list of this current century. I'm not going all the way back. <laughs> okay, and uh, follow it up with this AI, and, you know, I think uh, about 60% of the people who spoke before me have talked about AI and so on. So we also are, um, uh, uh, have been using a little bit of AI. I'll, I'll talk briefly about some of the results. And then I want to talk about something called uh, TDA or topological data analysis. Um, and you might ask wha what it is. I, I'm, how many people are familiar with TDA? Okay. Uh, to the others who are not familiar with TDA, I, I would say that it's a different beast altogether. Yes, there is a uh, is topology in the title, and I tell people that it is a, a short cousin of quantum computing. It's like a short cousin of uh, quantum computing. Short, small. I mean, small cousin. Uh, it's just like quantum computing. Physicists build kind of build quantum computer. We computer scientists want to get into it and solve problems. Similarly, mathematicians build. Uh, the tool for TDA and computer scientists and mathematicians are trying to get into it and, uh, and solve problems. And I will uh, talk about two applications where we try to apply this model, uh, this interesting model to solve some of the questions that we are trying to answer. So going back to my top uh, three contributions where I think we move the needle is, uh, I think goes without saying, is the uh, the genomic revolution, right? The human genome project and so on, turn of the century, the you know, algorithms, alignment, mapping, everything, all the string algorithms that we did, and I think uh, it is kind of undisputed. And uh, I don't know how many of you noticed, um, yesterday was Google's 20th anniversary, and they put out a video in which, uh, you know, they, they can tell you what is on the top of an average person's mind because they, they can get the uh, most frequently asked query for the year. Okay, and so it turns out that in 2003, I don't know if you can read it, the top question was, what is the human genome project? And this is from Google, so I think, um, you know, this is interesting that it's not just scientists, it's people out on the streets who are also curious about the genome project. Anyway, so that's, uh, that I think algorithms played a very big role there, bioinformatics and algorithms. The second one, might take you by a little bit of surprise, but I'm giving you what I think. Um, this is about the gene editing and CRISPR that I'm sure everyone here knows about it. And it came about because in 2005, there were three innocuous uh, papers, uh, bioinformatic, doing bioinformatics kind of analysis, uh, doing due diligence, and the results that they came up with is that they saw short palindromic repeats in bacterial sequences. They were looking at lots of bacterial sequences. And they, showed this, they saw these short repeats, and they were interspersed with what looked like viral sequences. You know, all these results can come only from bioinformatics-like uh, um, analysis. And not only that, they were sitting next to a gene which was homologous to genes that is involved in DNA repair, the Cas9. And this got the biologists, microbiologists, Jennifer, and so on, thinking that this perhaps is the um, acquired uh, um, <coughs> immune mechanism for bacteria to fight viral uh, infection. And the rest is, of course, history. They kind of uh, um, explored it, and then we have a uh, gene editing there. And the, the third one, I'm just calling it hominins. What I mean is, the, you know, here the field of phylogeny and the graph graphs and networks and everything that we have to contribute to this, um, to this uh, field of uh, relationship between species, interspecies, and intraspecies, and so on. A and in fact, intraspecies in terms of um, ancestral rec recombinations graph and, uh, and so on, which was in the background picture of my uh, title slide. So, uh, 
Now I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, an application of AI or machine learning. It's ubiquitous, much more ubiquitous now than it was, say, 10 or 15 years, 15 years ago, say. I know at CA, CMU, it, it, probably the scene didn't change, and people didn't notice the scene changing, but everywhere else people have noticed. And now more and more people are using ML and AI. Not just researchers who work in ML and AI, but anyone who works with data works with ML and AI, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And um, we applied this uh, to a problem. I want to talk, um, I'll talk briefly about this problem. This, is, uh, this paper is under review, under submission right now. And uh, this is work with MLL, which is, about, which is a top uh, blood diagnostic company in Europe based in, uh, in Germany. And uh, one of the problems, we worked on different, uh, different aspects. One of the problems we're looking at is that they're in, they're in the business of diagnosis. So we are looking at blood cancer. Here, all the diseases are, of course, blood cancer. And we want to distinguish subtypes. Okay? They have different mechanisms that they use, you know, histology, karyotyping, and so on. And of course, you can use RNA-seq data and, and everything, genomic data as well. So the curiosity was that if we looked only at DNA data, just, just DNA, am I able to say, is there any discriminating signals about the subtypes of blood cancer. Why is this problem a little difficult? Because if you're talking about, say, uh, breast cancer and, say, pancreatic cancer and so on, it is a little easier to distinguish these because their cells of origin are different. Whereas here, um, they, uh, they're all in uh, the origin of these cells is the hematopoietic stem cells, and um, so it becomes a little difficult. And we, um, the, uh, the um, donut plot that I'm showing you here is that we also took the genome and broke it up not into random parts, but into uh, genic parts and non-genic parts. And within the genic parts, we look at the intronic parts and the exonic parts. And in the non-genic part, we also look at the annotated parts. That is that we know something about, you know, like the pseudogene or non-coding RNA or anything that you know about it is the uh, annotated part, and this is the exonic part, and so on. So we are going to look at each of these pieces separately and do machine learning on them. And um, here, what we want to do is that we take some uh, blood, uh, the blood cancer subtypes, and see if there is discriminating signals about this. We don't know what they are at this point. We don't care. We, is there any discriminating signal in these genomic portions of uh, of the DNA? And we tried a panoply of ML and AI methods. And I'm just showing you the results of that in terms of F1 score. That is how, how discriminating were they. And darker green means that they were pretty good. And light means they were pretty bad. And of course, I'm also showing you the permuted data just to get the baseline saying if you permute the data, you should not be seeing any signals. Because if you do see signals in permuted data, but maybe you're picking up something that really doesn't exist. And this took us by surprise because um, with most of these methods, the results are not anything to write home about. They are actually pretty poor. But of course, this point, you know, the, the fact that disease is heterogeneous and the tumors, are, that is intertumor heterogeneity, intratumor heterogeneity, and so on. So taking all these into account, we actually um, um, fine-tuned our AI algorithms to have a different kind of embedding there using some stochastic regularization and so on. And lo and behold, the, uh, it, began, uh, it began to see signals in the data, not just where we are expecting, but also in the dark matter. This is the dark matter. So dark matter is something w what, in a sense, we know nothing about. And this, uh, and this definition that we uh, take of these different genomic regions is very conservative towards the dark matter. In the sense, if you know anything about it, it goes into some other segment, either annotated or, or exonic, intronic, somewhere else, annotated mostly, right? And it is surprising that the dark matter alone is able to discriminate some of these uh, blood cancer subtypes. 
And the, the next test, of course, is that since these areas are not the same, the lengths are not the same, if we normalize the lengths, do we still see the signals? And it actually continues. The signal actually continues. And so the conclusion is the dark matter matters. And, um, and, it is, and, it took, and then, of course, we uh, probed further and tried to see what the signals, uh, what, what were the regions that were having, the, but, but we know nothing about these because they're totally in the dark. So it, this is an appeal to the scientists to, and biologists to actually um, get funding or whatever and start exploring these dark uh, regions because there appears to be some signal there which can, uh, which can discriminate these different subtypes. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the other topics. There were some other probings that we did, but this was my um, uh, main. Um. So now I want to talk about um, topological data analysis. And at the risk of being a reductionist, I'm going to describe this entire big field in one minute in one slide. <laughs> and um, so. So I'm showing some objects here. The top three objects are different from the bottom three objects. Would anyone want to take a guess as to what is the difference between? They're all similar to each other, but different from the uh, second. Right. So he knows the answer. So the, the, um, the top objects, you, can, uh, you cannot contract them to a point. The bottom three objects, you can contract them to a point. So topology is all, you know, sort of um, uh, helps you distinguish these, uh, these kind of uh, structures. And of course, we want to use this. So we have simplices, which discretizes them. And there is uh, um, algebra that helps manipulate them in the computers and so on. And you have different kinds of complexes, like check, alpha, viatoris, rips, and so on, with, where you can take your problem and map into these complexes and have your queries or probe the data. So what you have on the left is sort of modeling your problem. And what you have on your right is um, actually probing or querying the data. So there is the notion of filtration. Filtration can be seen as um, uh, viewing, say, your data at different scales. Say, imagine your nose is pressed against the TV screen, and you don't see much. And as you begin to step back, take one step at a time, certain uh, pictures emerge, and then you have a clear picture of what it is. And some might appear and uh, disappear, and so on. So that's the process of uh, filtration. And persistent homology is about uh, some of these characteristics that uh, persist across the different scales as you go through the filtrations. These are not mathematical definitions, but I'm trying to give you a sense of what the definitions are. And, and associated with this, I said you see, some, uh, you, know, you see some patterns that appear and disappear. So these are different uh, homology classes. In other words, these are holes, so-called holes, holes of different dimensions. So uh, filtration is actually you're moving from here to here. You, know, you use some quantity that lets you, uh, uh, lets you uh, traverse this space. And as you're traversing, different holes are being born and at different dimensions. They are born and then they die. So these bars actually represent a homology a class which was born here and it doesn't die. So he, it was born here, and it dies here, and so on. This is a homology class of dimension 1, dimension 2, and so on. So, so this is a processing that the system will do. When you use TDA, what you're doing is you just hang on to these bars. This, this is your universe, and you kind of work with it, if you are working on persistent homology. But of course, the, it is all about the, uh, the bars that you have. When, when we have these applications, we want to associate these, uh, these bars back uh, to our uh, objects, to our input that we had, uh, we, we had given. And it turns out that they don't have a unique representation. So they can be represented by uh, different simplices. So we introduce the notion of essential simplices, which we presented in Wabi 2018. And uh, this gives, uh, under certain conditions, we prove that there will always exist an essential sim um, uh, simplex. Uh, there will always exist non-empty essential simplices. And they have, and that's a unique way of going from the bars 
to your input data. So now once we have this handle, we can actually uh, interpret some results that we'll get. And, and just like the bar plot that I showed you, now that you can associate, uh, associate these bars with your entities, you can have a different kind of plot, which we are calling the RFL plot or rainfall-like plot, where the x-axis are your entities that you're dealing with, that's your data, and uh, the points can be either bars or they can be dots, that is the birth point, death points, uh, and so on, okay, uh, of the different homology classes. So, and we are building a system called Matilda, which will uh, do these, these sort of topologic, topological um, manipulations and essential simplices and so on. It's under construction. Once it's ready, we'll make it available and so on. So I want to apply it into the, um, into the metagenomics problem. So everybody is already familiar with it. The, you, the question is, why should we be interested in metagenomics? I don't think I need to spend time on that. The gut microbiome uh, is being implicated in disease and health. And with time, we are realizing how important this is. And also, outside this anthropocentric thing of anything to do with humans, I'm interested, and <laughs> otherwise I may not be. Uh, you know, in the food supply chain, for example, you could be checking the uh, microbiomes as, you, as the food passes through the food supply chain, or even in soil microbiome and so on. So these are the different areas where this is useful, and you could be looking at it. And here is a, sp here is a problem that uh, mm, uh, we are addressing here, a small problem here is that, uh, it, and it is, a, it is a problem of strain identification or signal enrichment. What it means is in, in the microbiome, uh, when you get the samples, you have gotten the genome of uh, multiple organisms, which are actually very similar to each other. When you take strains of a, uh, of a bacteria and so on, they're very similar to each other in sequence. And so as a result, when you get these reads, these reads begin to map to multiple organisms, say in your reference database. So as a result, what you would have is that you, there are chances of getting high false positives because you might get a lot of hits and a lot of mappings which, um, to organisms that just don't exist. So uh, we now want to solve the problem. We are not doing the mapping problem. It's good bioinformatics that does the mapping, takes the read, maps it to this, uh, you, assuming there are good reference database. We come in downstream and say, after, you've, after these have been mapped to these multiple organisms, and I have this whole story, now I'll try to say which are possibly not true organisms here. How much time do I have? Oh, you still have seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Anyway, so so let's, let's see what the problem is. So these are the three organisms, say A, B, and C. And these are the reads. So I have some reads, SA, that maps, say, only to A, and then some reads that map to A and B. So you have these reads that are mapped to A and B, and so on. So this is the organism that you have. And, um, and what uh, and if I take the set SAB, I can also get the coverage or the depth in A for AB, and I can get the coverage or depth um, in B for AB, and so on. So each AB, I, I will get these um, that other information as well. So this is my complete information. That is, for AB, I get A and B, and you know, for ABC, I get ABC, and so on. So I will get these different depths and so this, this is my setup. Now I want to map it to uh, a, a complex, the, a simplicial complex that can be useful for me. So after much head scratching and so on, we found um, barycentric subdivision. Barycentric is not something that we discovered. It probably goes back to the beginning of last century uh, and almost to the <laughs> to the beginning of uh, uh, topology to Poincare's time, there was something called barycentric subdivision. So uh, this was a natural map to that. So we defined the filtration on the um, uh, barycentric. So we play the game of actually doing the filtration. As I showed you before, you pull out the, the bars. And of course, you pull out the essential simplices from the bar, so you can do the unique mapping to this. And uh, we, of course, define a scoring function because we want to score this, and this, that completed our model. And uh, when uh, we tried this on uh, data sets where we knew the goal truth, the true positives do, um, um, do bubble up to the top. The next question I want to ask is, can I use a model that can use less information? Okay, so 
let's take this case again. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to look at the depth at each level. I will just take the number of reads. I don't care how much it covers. I don't care this, uh, the, what the size of the reads is. I will just take the number. And now the question is, do these numbers alone help, help me in solving my problem? And again, you have to map it to a complex. Here it has a natural mapping to what is called a check complex. And then we play the same game again. We do the filtration, pull out the bars, pull out the essential simplices, associate a score. And lo and behold, it actually works. In the, and this is some real data that we are showing. And the, uh, once you order this list, uh, once you order the OTUs, what you see on the top the ones in green are the actual true positives. And you do see that they have bubble to the top. And uh, this is uh, the one shown in blue here. If you take a naive approach of saying, I will just take only unique uh, hits and so on and so forth, they also actually show up as true positives. Uh, uh, they're just a point to show that this works better than, say, a naive method. And now, if I may say, that I want to say um, a future of GWAS. And um, uh, if I may, so I, I'm adding it that way because you know, um, uh, GWAS, of course, is grounded in very sound statistics and, uh, and so on. But it, ha it has its limitations. So I'll show you an example of what we are doing trying to. So this is ongoing work. And uh, so this is going towards a, what is the future sort of a thing. So we, I will take, I'll show you what we are doing with the so-called traditional um, GWAS, um, the epi epi methods, machine learning AI methods, and then we are, we are trying to bring in TDA and so on, and to trying to answer complex questions in that context. So here, the, um, uh, this is an NIH project. So this is on Alzheimer's disease. The data that we are using is ADNI and uh, ADSP. And to cut a long story short, so we use this epi kind of methods, which is logistic regression filtered and so on, So and, and then feed it to a big uh, machine learning, um, we grind on the machine learning to get some stable features and so on. Of course, there are some details about you know, how you don't overfit and what are the features you're looking for, are the features stable, and so on and so forth. And then at the end of it, again, we go back to the GWAS-like or the epi sort of methods. We filter it, and then it spits out the number of genes it thinks that distinguish, say, disease from control here. This is not a final answer here. I'm just showing you the uh, a pipeline that that, that we are using, and uh, um, this is just a placeholder for the, the genes that one, one would show up here. And once you have the genes, you can do the, you know, what is traditionally done, you know, sort of uh, enrichment analysis and so on with networks and things like that, and you can get um, networks of pathways. You can detect pathways and networks of pathways uh, and so on. And this has been discussed at length in the previous talks as to much more sophisticated <coughs> methods than, than what even we have used here. And um, the interesting thing which, which we find interesting is in this huge pipeline of you know, doing the machine learning and getting all the pathway information and so on, we are doing uh, some perturbances and, and so on. But we, want, we are applying persistent homology with essential simplices <coughs> to to answer questions, and the, que the qu questions we are answering here is that, you know, the diseases are complex. They they don't manifest exactly in the same way in uh, in all patients. So different patients have different classes or different groups of pathways at work, and this is something that we want to extract from the data. And um, and this is done through. Yeah, I'll stop in 30 seconds. This is my last uh, slide. And um, so we are actually combining uh, logic with persistent homology. This is uh, part of an NSF grant under DMS, the mathematics department. And um, this, this is work with my collaborator, Shugata Basu, in uh, Purdue University. And uh, uh, like I said, the kind of information that you would pull out is that you would actually take the set of patients who are affected by the disease, and you will have subgroups of the patients. And for each group, you are actually saying, what are the pathways that uh, would have, may have played a role? 
And to, just to summarize, in the field of topology, we kind of introduced the idea of essential simplicis, notion of barycentric filtration. We'd like to contribute to the community through a software system called Matilda. And the two abstract modeling problems that I talked about today was metagenomics and GWAS. And I think there will be uh, many more. And hopefully, this will answer questions that is not answerable uh, or much harder to ans answer otherwise. And uh, quickly, my collaborators, Torsten on the MLL data, Jerry and Badri on the Alzheimer's data, Pierre on type 2 diabetes data, where we had done a proof of concept of uh, logic and TDA on, uh, to elucidate uh, complex pathways, uh, but on the uh, microbiomes and the food supply chain, and Shagata Basu, my um, TDA uh, collaborator. And uh, my team, without whose grit and uh, and determination, we wouldn't get most of these results. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Is there any question? Yes. Uh, for the metagenomics part, where you uh, then uh, get like the elements for the different. Uh, does it work better than uh, when you would use uh, like EM algorithm approach, for example, where you would uh, see what's most probable, like which ones are most probably present? Um, so we we have tried only with uh, the comparable methods like Kraken and others that we were uh, uh, that we are comparing. So we haven't uh, actually uh, tried any other. The abundance is a different problem, right? So. That was not the problem being addressed here. Ab abundance problem would probably be added on to this. This we're just trying to see um, which organisms are not not present. Kind of. So it's possible once we once we define it and then compare an apples to apples, then maybe one can uh, do that sort of a thing. But we had taken some simple algorithms uh, and uh, compared against that. Okay. Okay, question. Well, let's thank our speaker again.